You are now listening to Out of the Blank. 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 Welcome to another episode of Out of the Blank Podcast. I'm here with Regis. Now, is it Mears? Yeah, Mears. Like Sears or Spears or Deers? Deers, Beaters, Mears. Cheers. Yeah, yeah. Tell me a little bit about yourself and what do you do professionally? A um, little bit about me. Um, I grew up in a city called West Valley City, Utah, just the west part of Salt Lake City. Grew up playing sports outside a lot. Uh, basketball, baseball, soccer, and those types of things. So I was busy year round. Um, grew up in the area all the way through high school, even. Um, uh, met my wife there in the same high school, and we moved away and started a family. Um, we just recently actually moved to Las Vegas this last month. So I moved down here for a career move, doing real estate down here. So that's kind of what I'm up to. So do you like doing real estate or is it just something kind of like a job? Uh, you got to love it to do it because it's, it's a lot of work and it's busy. Um, there's different levels of it though, because you got to think of the different ways of, of purchasing property. There's agriculture, you know, like your farmers and stuff. Then there's residential, which most people are, are that's how they buy real estate. And then there's commercial and then there's industrial. So there's many, many layers to it. So to, depending on what you're passionate about, you can find something that you mostly enjoy. Um, but like when it comes to real estate, first of all, you're selling, there's the residential commercial, like it's kind of like HVAC in a way, like the different properties, obviously. Like, so what are the ones you mostly deal with? Are you just dealing with a lot of residential stuff? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I'll be helping uh, people buy and sell residential houses. How many times do you have to be do an open house? Um, it depends. Uh, some people don't like to do any. Um, I don't really do with any people selling houses. I deal with mostly people buying houses. So me, myself, I don't do any. Um, but I know agents that do, you know, one every other week. I, I'm going to bring up this weird kind of question to you. So do you think they could end the homeless population numbers if they could literally just let all these empty homes? Because I know there's a lot of empty homes just sitting out mm -hmm. on the market. If they could give maybe like a program, give a hobo a six months kind of <laughs> journey of like, you know, give him nice clothes, give him some food, try, give him six months to get a job and get on his feet and just let him use one of those homes. Mm hmm. Um, I don't think you'd end homeless, the uh, a homeless problem, but I think that would help a lot of people. Like you get a j good chunk of people to kind of get a fresh start. I think what you'd find a problem with though, is that like squatters or like, I know that's already a problem, but I mean like, um, freeloaders. That's what I'm like saying. After, to... after six months, you kick them the fuck out if they're not getting a job. You don't see their life going any better. Mm -hmm. They're just wasting the money and wasting the resources we're giving them, missing opportunities. Mm -hmm. You start to be like, all right, well, we gave you a shot and you failed. How do you – that's hard to kick them out though. How? Like, oh, there's ways that people can lock themselves in a house. Bruh. You basically, you gave them the key to the house. What you do is you just bust down the door. Sorry, bro. Get out, man. <laughs> We let you in the house. The, door now. <laughs> it, the, the government, I'm saying, the government, I think, can, you know, th shell out the cost for maybe a couple doors or so. I mean, come on. <laughs> Our tax dollars go to so vendor. much, you know, I'm telling you. Yeah, I like that idea. That's I, I mean, that really does get a lot of people like that help. But isn't that what, like, those safe houses are, though, or whatever they are? They'll get well, they overrun. Have, they have they have shelters, but the problem is it's just there to have a roof over their head. It's not about getting them the, the kind of the tools in a way to get on their feet. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And it's very, very yeah. difficult to kind of work at a shelter or be in a shelter if you're a homeless person because you're surrounded by so many people that are living the same kind of life you are that you don't have the drive to kind of push forward. But if we gave you more of – I feel like people need more one-on-one -on -one time 
Um, especially when it looks at the homeless population, if you're not choosing to be homeless yourself, you kind of have to look at, they need a little bit more help than others because they're a little worse off. And usually they have the mindset, like the world kind of gave them the raw end of the deal or they made bad choices and they need all the assistance they can get. And a lot of people kind of just gloss them over because they just think they're going to not really change their ways, which is true in some cases. Yeah, I agree with you. You think six months is enough time, though? I well, not. I didn't mean enough. I meant too much. Like six six months for a one person to live in a house, though. I think six months is enough to start creating a sustainable money thing. Like no, no, that means they don't have to pay utilities. They don't have to pay anything. It's all paid for for six months. That <laughs> once that six months is up, you make sure. Did they save their money or did they blow it? If they blew it all then sorry, that's it. You, you had your shot. Because after that six months, you're kicked out, and then you have to do it on your own now. But it's, it's all about like people would check on you maybe every couple of days, make sure that you're doing what you need to be doing, make sure you're not wasting the money. If they can tell you're wasting the money straight off the back in like the first two months, it, they're out of there. But enough to build a mm-hmm. source of income and be able to save some away, you know, also pay for their own food and stuff. And eventually mm-hmm. you get to see that responsibility and that shift kind of happen. The problem is when you buy a house when you go off an adventure on your own it's so immediate everything is and it's like you need to have a safety net that's why a lot of people choose to stay after high school with their parents um, for mm-hmm. a little while just to get a good boundary or a good background in their account or something yeah I just think if someone had an easy ride for six months well I, that's a that's the other thing is if someone's not taking it serious then they're not going to take advantage of that opportunity for a place to live and get their self on their feet. So maybe it's like a sponsor type deal. Like, yeah. you know, somebody that needs help, then, then like a, like a co-signer, someone who already owns a home can co-sign on this, this six month program. Johnny Depp owns like 36 houses. We can get him in on this. <laughs> he doesn't he even really? live in them. He does not live in them. He just keeps buying houses. And there, his manager has told him multiple times to stop. And he just keeps <laughs> buying them. They're like, hey, that, that's worth something more, though. They're good for the real estate agent that's selling them. But the fact is, they're millions of dollars worth of houses, like $50 million. Yeah. And he's not living in them. They're just there. Yeah. That's a, well, when you got so much money, what do you do with it? See, what I want to go into is, is investment properties and owning properties, but I'm not talking about owning multi-million dollar property because the problem with those ones is that they're custom built or they're so extravagant that only people that wish for that type of feature in the home are interested in that home. So like in a, a standard single family home with three bedrooms, the market for that home is so big. There's so many people that are interested in it. Like, oh, Monop- like Johnny- Monopoly in a way. Like everybody wants Boardwalk. Yes, sure. With with Johnny Depp's situation, though, if he wants to sell one of those houses, how many people have millions of dollars ready to buy a freaking house? He doesn't want to sell. That's the problem. Why, why do that, though? Because he's like, I like stuff, and I can buy it. So here it goes. So I'm pretty so sure I'll we're going to see Pirates of the Caribbean like 48. <laughs> like he's going to be making this movie up. for a long time. He's going to be in a wheelchair as Captain Jack Sparrow. I wouldn't be mad at that. I like it. I mean, he's a good actor for sure. Isn't there a house on the market that the guy who built it, it's like the it's like the most expensive house in the world. And he ended up like not being able to live in it anymore because he couldn't afford it. I believe that like taxes were so much. It was literally like each month, I think in cost expenses and all the housekeepers and everything that was in, it was like 50 million something dollars. The house was like, a, the house was like, I think close to almost a billion dollars like built. It had its whole front yard was the size of like 20 golf courses. There was over 400 staff working there and the dude just went bankrupt. I mean, and now there's just an empty house, this giant, enormous labyrinth sized thing just sitting on the market. Where is this at? Oh man, I got to look this up. Uh, I, I remember hearing about it because I was like, 
because I, I knew I was like, that had to be some boxer or some famous person that decided um, to build that house. But I'm like going bankrupt after you build like a dream home and like nobody, everyone that goes look at it, they go, how much is it? Yeah. It's um in Mumbai. It's valued at $1 billion. <laughs> oh and the guy Holy goes, cow. I mean, we all, I think when it comes to like a wealthy lifestyle, the most immediate picture I have in my head is like the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, like the Carl, like Carlton's household and everything. Mm -hmm. Like that was like, you know, I think like you get to see subtle things when you go into a home, which you probably notice yourself, even though a home mm -hmm. might not be very expensive, but there's subtle details that can add to the building. I don't know if you're a fan mm -hmm. of architecture. Oh, yeah. Um, I like architecture based on older sized buildings. I mean, I like to look at an older like brick church or, you know, a, a stone house, you know, with cobblestone and moss growing on the side. And you, yeah. go, you go and find out that that house is actually relatively new. It's just the, the little effect they play on it. Like they add that mm -hmm. moss in for extra features. And it's the same reason why any person who thinks of rich, what do you think of immediately? Uh, gold, gold and white pillars. Oh yeah. For some fucking reason, if you're rich as hell, if you got the monopoly man money, you think white pillars out of nowhere. You're like, my house needs white pillars. My house, <laughs> I need a hundred white pillars out on the front of my house. Like why? I don't know. Just cause it, that's what rich people do. Yeah. It, I feel like it makes a house look taller, like bigger than it really is. What do you think is like in your description, the best type of house, like you like a small cottage. Um, for me, the best type of house is an open floor plan where you can have the kitchen and living room areas all combined together, but not too open to where the bathroom's exposed. No, not, not that far. I mean, I would want like the bedrooms on the outskirts of the house kind of hidden. So it's not like you go down a hallway and it's hiding behind stuff before you get to bedrooms and bathrooms, but the main living quarters just big and open tall ceilings. That's, that's that how, kind of that's how usually the houses I get are. They, um, they all got an open floor plan. Like you go up the stairs and there's like the balcony, the railing, you can still see off into the family room. Uh, it makes it difficult because my bathroom is right next to my bedroom. So when I pop out and people are watching movies, I like take a massive shit. And next thing you know, everyone's like, Oh my God, you just ruined the movie. I'm like, sorry. Damn. It's got that damn open floor plan. You need a poop, poopery. Do you use that? Uh, I use a lot of Febreze and candles. I started buying candles, but then I realized I can't use a candle when I'm actually in the bathroom because there is a thing with methane. Apparently, it's flammable. <laughs> yeah, that can happen. Well, I started using um, it's. It comes in a little bottle, in a spray bottle, and before you before you drop a deuce, you just do a couple squirts. Is that the, the toilet? toilet spray? Is that the toilet spray? Yeah. Shit? I have it in my yeah. car because I'll fart in my car and then I'll like get out and then I'll, <laughs> I'll go like into the store. Look, I have the funniest story. Okay. So, me and my cousin went to the store and I mm. farted and I guess I farted before we parked, but it was silent. So I was like, oh, it doesn't smell. It's going to be okay. Then we get out. We go inside the store for an hour and a half. I mean, we went walking. It was like around the mall kind of. We came back. Mm. I, as soon as I sat in the car, I was like, oh, shit. You did. My cousin you gets out yourself. of the, my cousin gets out of the, but I enjoy my stuff. I'm like, I'm proud of that shit. So my, <laughs> my cousin gets in the car, goes, Jesus. And he gets out, opens up every single door of my car, opens up the trunk, everything. and just stands right off to the side. And he's like, I'm letting that motherfucker air <clears> out. <throat> So I started keeping that spray in there. I'll just like spray the seat or I'll spray the ceiling and you won't even know. You're like, why does it smell like apples and cinnamon in here? I'm like, it smells good though, right? <laughs> what you didn't know is I just farted. What you didn't know is I've been drilling holes in this motherfucker all day. <laughs> but I do that. All, I wonder that if people do that too, because I'll get to where I need to go and I'll fart and then come back. And then you smell it and you're like, God damn, why'd I do that? I started like, carrying, I, st I work at a hotel. So when I go and like take the trash out of the bathroom, people leave like a Febreze or like one of those pocket things so they can spray the bathroom because you don't want to mm -hmm. shit. And then the housekeeper go in there and know you took a shit. But, um, 
it's funny because I'll have that and I'll put it in my shirt pocket at work. So I'll walk around whenever I fart somewhere, I just spray it. <laughs> that's, that's funny that you use that because it's strong as hell, isn't it? Like when you spray it, it, it releases all the smells. But I prefer actually- that because I'm so distinctive with my stuff. And when I get on the elevator, I don't know why, like it just happens. Like I don't mean to force it out. I don't do anything like that. It just randomly slips. Like I'll bend down next day and I'm like, I'm like, oh shit. <laughs> But they're so like paint, like tear the paint off the wall type shit where it's like someone gets on the elevator. Holy shit. And then like, like I'll have to warn people like, Hey, I just, I'm letting you know I did that. And they're like, did you? And I was like, yeah, I, I'm, I admit to that shit. I mean, I got IBS. What do you want from me? <laughs> That's funny that you say, I, I'm a first to call out when I fart. So someone can't accuse me of farting. They'll know before, before they even smell it. If you can't joke and if you can't talk about it, then what's the point of having it? <laughs> Amen. A lot of people get turned off when it comes to that stuff. I'm like, nah, it's, it's, it's a human thing. You don't, don't, if you act like you don't fart, there's something wrong with you. Yeah, that's the thing. Everybody does it. Everybody poops. <laughs> now, do you, do you, like for me, when I get, if, so, if someone offered me a million dollars, so you'd want an open floor plan house. So if someone mm-hmm. offered me a million dollars, I wouldn't go big and expensive. I would go small yeah. and fill it with a lot of nice stuff. Okay. Mostly because if you have a super huge house, um, it's going to cost a lot. And like, why do you need 30 rooms if it's just you and somebody else in there? Mm-hmm. That's what I wonder too. And why even get uh, what you just said? It's going to cost a lot to to keep up. I mean, where where I'm living now in Las Vegas, luckily I'm here as the um, the winter is coming, so it's it's not very hot right now. But it, it gets up to 100 teens. So you stay within 15 minutes of air conditioning. And now, if, if you have a house that's 4,000 square feet, and you got to cool that entire house all day long. Your your electric bill is running, like running you to the ground. So a smaller house stays stays pretty cool. And a lot of like a lot of people don't even realize that when uh, Vegas or uh, Nevada in general just floods, it floods a lot. Considering you're in mm-hmm. a desert, but it rains and that water has mm-hmm. nowhere to go. Right. It's I mean similar with what happened in Houston. It's just a big city with a lot of concrete. So yeah, it doesn't rain very often, but when it does, it's it's a like a monsoon, like how Arizona gets them. I've been so, to Vegas. It, so I've been to Vegas a couple of times. I remember staying at the hotel, and um, I would wake up, and my grandmom's like, "I'm like, why is all the lobby like? Why is there a whole bunch of people in the lobby of the casino just vacuuming the floor, and all the furniture's moved?" And like, oh, there's a flood last night. I was like, it just rained a little bit. They're like, yeah, but it has nowhere to go. Yeah, it's just like a river. And that's why if you notice when you're driving around the city at all, if you ever look down in like big gullies, you'll see these tunnels that start underneath. So like the road, if you look down, there's a ditch and then a tunnel starts. So all over the entire city, they have these tunnels. And at first there's speculations that they were built for like transportation or they're used for like uh, some other random crap. Mole people. Uh, I that yeah you so you've you've watched those mole people you've seen those things that fucking documentary dude because i was like there has to be or if there's homeless people there's got to be people that have like an underground society what do you know you go down into like what they're supposed to be like the best sewage system or the best yeah there's gonna be people living in fucking sewers and holes and shit yep it's gonna happen yeah. And they're filled with people. You see that there's like each quarter or each like sections have their own like type of homeless people though. Yeah, there's the smart section like Albert Einstein <laughs> Avenue, and then there's like you, know, you ever you ever like they got specific label that's like streets, but they got different like uh-huh. hallways based on what you're interested in. They got like yep. you know Tesla Block. It's like that's like where you know <laughs> most of the shit comes from the hotel, so they get that radioactive like kind of <laughs> feature on them. And then they've got some with like if all the meth users are in one tunnel and all the like crack crack it's users all, are in another tunnel. It's fallout, dude. It's the damn tunnel snakes. It's it's creating vault <laughs> systems, dude. We've been doing it from the start. I think everybody's kind of like I said, there's two types of people, but I think there's a lot of people in this world that don't like associating with um the average everyday people that either whether mm-hmm. they're too smart um, to have a conversation where they can explain themselves good. Um, like kind of Elon Musk seems a little bit too smart. He's not a very good speaker compared to a Neil deGrasse Tyson 
that can kind of talk you into what like a dumbed down version of what he's trying to explain. Um, and then you got like people that, um, just don't like to associate with other people. And I think that's where it falls into the lines of tunnel people. I mean, they found a community and for most people in the world, they want to surround themselves with people that think and act and talk and kind of look exactly the same. Yeah. It's, it's fascinating. Cause I mean, have you ever decided to take a real estate adventure down to maybe selling some tunnel homes? I haven't. I don't know how we would do that though. You go and find an empty section that's not claimed. Go go to the government, <laughs> be like, how much is it to buy under Third Avenue? They're like, what do you mean buy under Third Avenue? I want to buy the whole drainage and sewage system under Third Avenue and I want to build a bunker for some people. <laughs> the problem is the market for those types of people. It's like it's like the the person trying to buy Johnny Depp's house. Like there's only a small market for those people that are looking for tunnel houses. <laughs> I think that's all with like basically every home because every home, I mean, everyone's looking for a home, but there's only like, it feels like specific homes for certain people, you know, like mm-hmm. a lot of people don't like a house that is like circular. I know a house that is circular, like a fucking spaceship on the ground and mm-hmm. it, it's badass. But my mom's like, I would not want to live there. I'm like, why? I'm like, cause you don't have square rooms. I'm like, but when did we decide square was like the normal thing? We just live our house by that now. Like everything, it comes into these acute angles. Like walls are at a perfect angle. All these things are at different angles. And I'm like, it's crazy. Cause I, I love nature so much and it really, really sucks as we're progressing forward in the world because we're building way more homes because we suffer from an overpopulation problem. Mm-hmm. And it sucks because I'm seeing a lot of stuff look exactly the same and it's everywhere. And a lot of it is just useless. Like I used to see a beautiful parks and beautiful trees. When I used to go to my buddy's house who lives out in the country, I went down there the other day, they built a brand new road, a two lane road before it was just one lane. And they have all these community homes that look exactly the fucking same. I'm like, damn, like literally we got lost from his house. We went to go take the shortcut through this, this kind of side community. Every house was exactly the same. And I swear to God, we got lost for three hours. I mean, it, that's, that's coming, coming the new norm for developed cities. If, if you're living in a small town, you're not going to see that. But the reason why you see those in, in big cities is when, when building houses and when, let me back up when buying and selling a house, it's, it's about the money that that's what it is all, all about because everyone moves the average, you know, five to seven years to a new house. Some people live in, in a home for their entire life, but for those that are constantly moving because of change, because because of work for so many different reasons your people are always buying and selling houses every five to seven years ish yeah so they, get, that, they get old of it right is that because they get tired of it and they want to change it um, they can but change in schools change uh, kids are, are involved in something different um a new job or a new church you know, something that, that happened that says I need to move to a closer area over here. So when you when that person bought their house, when they come to sell sell it, they want the most they can get out of it. That so makes sense. In order in order to do that, what wow. builders are doing is making their their developments all similar. That way when when you go to buy and sell the home, you the value of that home doesn't raise or lower based off of the houses around them. Oh, so it's, it's like a template, like with movies and video games, they have a template, like Call of Duty has a template. They know what works. So they just can add a few mm-hmm. subtle differences, but they can keep the same thing mm-hmm. because that's what the majority of the population likes. Right. Because that, that way, yeah, when that person, they, they buy that home, that's the same as everybody else. When they sell it, they know that they're going to get the most value out of it because it's, it's similar to the rest of around them think of it this way if you have a bunch of rundown crappy houses all in an area and then you have a mansion in the middle of this crappy neighborhood do you think that mansion is worth the same as 
a mansion in a neighborhood filled with other mansions? No, that mansion's value is going to decrease, but the houses around its value is actually going to increase. Exactly. So if they're all the same, they're all going to grow the same together. So the key is build a box by Bill Murray's house and your property value will go up the fucking charts. (laughs) Absolutely. You get the most bang for your buck. (laughs) I would say blow the roof off the place, but it's a cardboard box, so it probably doesn't have a roof. Or it's too wet, it won't explode. Yeah, that's that's really strange because I see some of like the homes nowadays. I'm like, wow, there's no originality in that and all. And then I see like a homeless person and he's got his tent and all these different add-ons to his house. I'm like, holy shit, like you're more creative than the guy that designed this house. <laughs> he's like, yeah, well, I got to the, I make got, it their own though. They're like, what do you I got, do if you're living on the street? You got to find something to personalize it to make it feel like home. Exactly. I think those are the innovators, bro. That's what I'm saying. If we just gave them six months, yo, imagine what they <laughs> could do. We might have a bunch of Elon Musk's running around. Just find, okay, so we need innovators and a co-signer, and we'll get them a six-month lease into a house, no cost to them. Have you Is ever- government funded? It, it sh- I think it, it should be a government program. They should get funded like a, a few, you know, maybe like a billion dollars or something to be able to do this. I mean, uh-huh. what's what what else are we spending it on, really? I mean, they say they fix the roads, but I've seen Papa John's fix more potholes than fucking the government has. <laughs> you guys have that down there? At, every po- place has a Papa John's has those things. Domino's, I, wait, is it Papa John's or Domino's that did it? I can't remember. They're they're fixing potholes across America. Yeah, I know Domino's did it too. But Domino's is like we we get people in with our crust. That crust is like a secret recipe for like mm-hmm. evil. <laughs> it's like the only reason you ever buy pizza is for the crust. Now I kind of want to bring this up. So you do a you do a podcast with uh, of course you know Todd Molas, who's been on this podcast before. I finally mm-hmm. got both of the scapes goats. I love it. I love it. Yes. I had a wonderful time being on. Um, it, it it's really interesting because you're the guy who's like the experiment rat in a way. Because Todd yeah. just throw all these fucking conspiracy theories at you, and you're just like listening to them. And I mean, yeah. I was I got to experience what that was like. We talked about the hollow earth, and I'm just sitting there, and me, mm-hmm. both of you, me, me and you, or just kind of sitting there, just like this sounds like a load of kind of shit in a way. Um, do you find that with all these conspiracies come out, you might start, you kind of have time to kind of believe in any, do you feel like there are some out there that really Todd kind of shifted you in a way? The only one that changed my mind is aliens. Before starting this podcast, I hadn't believed that aliens ever came and visited this planet. Never believed that anyone's been abducted. I don't believe that there'd been UFO sightings. None of that. After doing this podcast, 100%, I believe. But the other ones, all other uh, theories that we've gone over from uh, things, um, there's been all sorts of different ones. There's been the Bermuda Triangle. We've gone through things, other uh, cryptids. We just finished our, our um, goodness sakes, our Halloween special that we just got done with. So we've done things like werewolves and such. Um Throughout all of them, I, I, I'm not persuaded from what he has to say, but he does, he blows my mind in the things that come up. And a lot of it is really hard to believe. And a lot of it, I can just call out bullshit right away. Cause it like it, what you experienced with the, um, uh, hollow earth one, it, it was all bogus. Like yeah. There was not one thing that I was like, oh, wow, that's convincing. Maybe that happened, but none of it. Well, um, I, I want you to shoot this over to Todd, okay? I want, I want, to, I want, I think we should all three do a podcast on this. I want to have both the scapegoats on uh, now that I got you on finally. So, okay. I want to do the second coming project. I don't know if you know what this is. No, I don't. You, as you described it, I'm the guinea pig, meaning I don't do, I don't, I don't go into this kind of stuff. It's really weird because I don't, I don't believe in conspiracy theories and I, I don't listen to podcasts much. So me doing a conspiracy theory podcast 
makes zero sense because I have no experience in it. But I think that's what works is because we have a guy like Todd who is much into podcasts and knows a lot about conspiracy theories. He's a skeptic. Where, yeah, it's such a perfect combo. I, all right, so the second coming project, at one point, it, I don't think it actually ever happened. It was just kind of an idea or a thought. There's this mask. I don't remember exactly what it was called, but it was supposed to be the mask that was touched by Jesus or ha- was like being able to like had Jesus's DNA on it, uh, the guy mm-hmm. they considered to be Christ. So they tried to recreate. The idea was to recreate using the DNA off the mask um, another Jesus Christ. And it was, it was like only kind of a thought or idea that was getting shot around the internet. But imagine that though, imagine recreating something. And they all did this on the basis of when they started cloning goats and animals, but there was a goat, a specific goat that they actually cloned where it took over like 60 or 70 something trials to actually get it down. Right. The thing suffered from major birth defects. I mean, the thing was coming out like, you know, clone it in like a test tube using DNA or something. We've learned to do that. Um, and you inject the cells into something and watch it grow or whatever. Uh, it would come out really fucked up, like three legs, two legs, fucking five eyes and all this shit. You're like, okay, this thing's got a major birth defect. Imagine if that happened when you were cloning Jesus Christ. (laughs) That's a a funny, funny picture there. Joe Rogan had a bit about it. He's like, it would be like, instead of turning water into wine, he turned cookies into dog shit. And like, (laughs) Like it's a it's a crazy concept. There's a lot of like I like conspiracy theories. I don't believe like I said, I'm open minded to all of them. I think like with cryptozoology, do I believe that there's a Bigfoot out there? Mm, I don't know. Because I look at all the other points that can go with it as well. Yeah, it's probably a highly likely possibility there isn't, but at the same time, there's also a species of ape. Um, who's to say we're not talking about a species of ape, considering that in Tibetan folklore, there's the Yeti, then in American folklore and Canadian folklore and more of kind of the North American folklore, there is known as Bigfoot. And that's on the concept of they, these two places had never interacted before the Tibetan monks. Any of these people did never ever interacted with anybody over here, but we had the same descriptions of these beasts, this, this Mm -hmm white creature so who's to say that they didn't see maybe a species of ape which are bigfoot and the yeti are apparently um from reading you know the bigfoot uh hunter's guide and all those things and the yeti uh i think they're called the yeti patrol um it's a giant cryptozoology like cult like a bunch of groups yeti patrol yeah yeti i love it patrolling for them yeti son but um i was looking into it and i was like Cryptozoology, let's understand what the study of that is. There's over two point, I think, two point two million species undiscovered left on land, and there's a total of six point six point six left undiscovered in the water. So there's mm. a there's a total of no, it's seven point six. There's a total of nine point eight million um estimated creatures or species left still to discover so we discover new thousands every year and that's not i know you're thinking how are we discovering thousands of new creatures every year well it's easy i'm i'm wondering how we know that we have that many to discover that's just an estimate we think there's either way more it's they gave us they gave us a number what they did was they shot really really low they fucking prices right it you know there could be um an estimated there's definitely more they're saying there's definitely more than 5 um million creatures left to discover in this earth either in the water or on land and then there's definitely not more than 20 something million so they shot right. it they middled it out For with some of those six. that's just an excuse to continue getting funding from the government to find animals but they but they're still discovering thousands every year though oh. so they really okay. so it, uh, they're, they're they're not wrong in saying that the estimate is true but i think once the number the numbers start dwindling down um eventually you know they're gonna be like all right 
well, there's not much left to discover out there. I mean, to think that we're going to discover everything on this earth with the technology we have now or in the next hundred years, probably not going to happen. But we're discovering things from like, there's, you know, the prey mantis. Well, there's over a hundred different variants of the prey mantis. There's over, you know, it's thousands. Mm. It's, it's what they're discovering is the subtle key features. And that's only, that number probably isn't going to dwindle down for a while because if we look at the fact of evolution, you know, or adaptation, mm. the fact that grasshoppers in certain situations can turn into locusts. It makes sense. So we could get more that aren't existing now than there will be in 10 years, 50 exactly. years. So that's when, I, that's when I just chalk up, like, don't throw cryptozoology out of the park yet. It might seen as mm -hmm. a pseudoscience, but it's the idea that there is always something else out there. Does that mean it's fucking Nessie? I don't know. But I'm not <laughs> saying don't throw everything out of the ballpark because as people, all our evidence and everything we say is scientific fact gets proven wrong 10 years later. So yeah. why don't we just give things time and see what happens? Well, the, the cool thing, too, about the, these types of animals, like you hear about the same type of animal, like with the Yeti and Sasquatch or Bigfoot, like everybody has their own kind of version and they're very similar. But like like the Wendigo, too, the Wendigo is is spotted in different places. Wendigo. And then, in other, Wendigo. And then there's another one like the Leeds Devil or the Jersey Devil. Yeah. Where, like there's similar sightings, similar description, just different areas. Well, if so you like, just look up cryptozoology, and we all know the basic ones like Bigfoot, Yeti, Giant Squid, um, what is it, uh, Mothman, all these very, very popular ones, you then start to look and find that there's other ones that dive into folklore. Like a lot, um, mm -hmm. I don't know if you ever heard of the Clarician or the Clurican. Um, that's uh, known as, that's known as the leprechaun's evil or, uh, evil cousin only on the concept of he basically ravages and torments barkeepers. Um, he drinks all the wine, he drinks everything, ruins your bar basically. And, um, if you're nice to him, he grants you good things. He, if you give him like offerings of wine and stuff, he treats your bar, right? You'll have good fortune. You'll make a lot of money. You'll do so many different things. And that's an Irish folklore. I think the mm -hmm. fantasy about so many things when it comes to folklore or just legends or cryptozoology is the mystery behind it. It's having that little bit of fantasy in a very, very bland reality. It's a good way to look at it. Yeah. It's a hopeful way to look at it. I think, like, what's one conspiracy theory that you straight up never bought that Regis has told you? Or not Regis, that Todd has told you? Todd, one that I never bought. One that, like, straight um, off the back, you La were like... Ya La Llorona was one of them. The, no, the, the one that we did, the Hollow Earth is probably the most... I was like, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. Yeah. I, I, I mean, it's not a bad concept of an idea, but it's the same reason, like, I think what happened was a bunch of scientists looked in a hole, and they were like, that hole goes so far down, there's no end to it. I bet the Earth is hollow. <laughs> And then, like, yeah. there's there's a legit – we talked about it. There's a legit place called the, the Well to Hell, and it's this mm -hmm. long-ass fucking hole that goes down, like, 20-something miles where to the point where, like, nobody could make it down because there's, like, lava and all this stuff that's kind of down there. Um, they thought it just didn't have an end. And then people were doing fake recordings of hearing screams as you were going down it, so it made it sound like you were literally entering hell. And I'm like, man, this is – this is some crazy stuff. What are we doing here? <laughs> yeah, I, I can't get on board with that idea. Because uh, I think we mentioned it in, in our show, too, when, when you were on with us. If For those that, let's take flat earthers and, and then hollow earthers, like they're two separate groups. For those that, that believe in that type of theory, I can, I think I can take to say they're open-minded or they... Oh, another way to put it they they are open to all theory ideas they're you know ben the Shap idea yeah, of is anything his, is possible is his name but, ben shapiro or ben carson but the guy that believes in the flat earth and he's one of the most respected neurosurgeons of all time oh i don't know ben shapiro isn't that that's a different guy right 
It might be Ben Did Carson. You- uh, he ran for president um, when Trump and uh, or when uh, Mitt Romney and um, what's his face Obama were running. Uh, I don't know. I know Ben Shapiro is a, he is a political guy though. But I thought he was just like a public speaker or something like that. Is he a flat earther too? Uh, he probably is. I think most political people are now becoming flat earthers for some reason. <laughs> I think it's the concept of like, I, it makes sense. It makes sense the way why people would think that it is a little bit of bullshit, but when you listen to it, it's all because the photos from space don't ever show a, like a, like a, a spherical thing. It kind of, you only get to see one side of the earth. You know what I mean? Each photo seems like it's one side, one side. It's like, where's the edges? Where's the ball sphere that we all see? You know what I mean? Without using a 3d, kind of cgi effect to a photo you can't get that even you can't do a pano shot of the earth it just doesn't happen um it's, it's too big though exactly like you're talking about the earth but like that's, it's one that's thing to take a picture of a backpack but you're trying to take a picture of the earth it's massive yeah you're you're thinking logical but with flat earthers they're like oh it just shows that there's a flat earth there's one side it's like a coin I'm not yeah. saying that's crazy thinking, but I'm saying I can understand where they're coming from with it. But I do think that that is kind of a dumb way of looking at it, mostly because we've already found so much. I think the one thing everyone wants to find out the government or somebody like this, they're keeping a secret. You know what I mean? Well, I, well, I come back to is why are you looking back? Why are we focusing on is the earth around or flat? When it, what is it going to change? Does that mean that you're as a new opportunity going to open up? Like, oh, the earth is flat. I can finally get my license. Like what? I what is it change? Just, I just want to find out if Matthew McConaughey is really stuck on that planet still. Because <laughs> technically right now and coming into the new year, he's been on that planet for seven minutes. Because apparently it's seven or seven years is only an hour there. So he's only been on there for, I think, like seven to 17 minutes. He's been in, on that planet. So we, he's got a fucking hour to get off that thing. So I'm just saying by the time I'm 60, I would like to save Matthew McConaughey. Okay. That's all I'm saying. Well, all I'm saying. <laughs> I choose to believe he's still in Interstellar. So when it comes to like conspiracy theories i'm gonna throw one your way that i actually created so i've been looking at i've been looking at the boy scouts and girl scouts um selling the cookies out in front of the store making me feel like shit for not buying any because they're like 50 dollars a box yeah yeah don't feel bad okay just making sure because um i was like why don't you ask me when i'm walking into the store like I have a credit uh, i'm like i'm sorry i have a debit card little bastard pulled out a fucking card machine Legit, yeah, they're all getting that now. Legit pulled out a card machine. I said, damn, I can't even get out of it now. I was like, I respect yeah. the hustle, but what do you got over there? We got Thin Mints. We got the, um, the, the, what are they? The, 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 Momo, the Samoas, the, the little Samoas. like, yeah, the coconut ones. Mm-hmm. And I'm looking at oh, them yeah. like, I'm like, how much are they? They're like $35. I'm like, for how much? And they're like 12 of them. I'm like, that's fucking terrible. Why do you, why does someone need, who's buying 12 boxes at a time though? No, it's one box with 12 in it. Oh, that's it? Yeah. Whoa. No, yeah. Fuck that. Yeah. I don't care. No. You want to go to space camp, go, go to space camp a different way. You ain't going this year. You know what I started telling uh, people that like, you know, the people at the mall, the kiosk at the mall and then uh, Girl Scout cookies or Boy Scouts. Like when you walk into the store, I just started making noises. Like I'm not, I'm not doing the game anymore. I just go, bye. And then I keep walking and then they don't know. What do you say back to someone going, ah, I'll just be like, Hey man, if you open up your mouth long enough, I could toss some of these cookies in there, bro. I, then I just keep going. If they're free, they're not going to make me pay for it, though. I would start, if I was a Boy Scout or like, a, yeah, I'm not going to gender identify. If I was a Girl Scout, I would take a box of the cookies and I'd start dropping them in people's like pockets and stuff. <laughs> slowly slipping them a cookie. They're like, did you put this cookie in there? I'm like, yeah, did you, did you eat it? Yeah, it was actually really good. Well, would you like to buy a box? Actually, yeah, I would. That's a really good idea. Well, all right, so my conspiracy theory on this. Imagine okay. if the head keeper, instead of kids selling 
cookies, they sold alcohol. Going door to door selling alcohol, but having a parent or a guardian near them to where it would be technically legal for them to be able to handle it. So going and selling instead of like, you know, you go to a mm-hmm. um, a community place, a sports game, a kid fucking pulls out a six pack. Get your six pack instead of buying cookies. That revolutionizes the game. Or you're seeing with, you know, this was actually a scare recently with the, you know, we talk about poison candy myth and how that was fake. Yeah. Okay. Edibles. That creates the poison candy myth. Yeah. That creates it and makes it real because how many times does a kid get a treat for Halloween or something? Next thing you know, they're stoned out of their mind. Yeah. There's That's, a story last last uh, Halloween about it in Colorado. I'm telling you, man. Like you go to all these places now, you really have to check your candy on, not for yeah. razor blades, but hope your kid's not getting a good old dose of THC in his body. I checked my daughter's uh, when we got home, and there was a, a battery. There yeah, I batteries. know. You guys said that you, had, you had to use it. If, uh, you needed one for your remote. I was like, that was perfect. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. Perfect timing, but uh, yeah, you absolutely got to check them. But to go back to your theory, I other than all of the laws that say you can do that, uh, <laughs> you, you want a bunch of little kids carrying around six packs? You would. They would. Their sales would go up so high. I believe it. And then look at imagine selling edibles. Like imagine if they're selling like. Like we, that guy keeps going to that crack house. Why does that little boy keep selling cookies at that crack house? <laughs> or maybe even making them better by just not selling just to average people, but selling to these people that are probably going to buy it because they're on major massive amounts of dope. Like you start selling a cereal bar or one of those things to a bunch of stoners, like you're immediately getting purchases. See, that's what I thought these little kids need to do is go around door to door, especially here in Vegas, some of like the um, older neighborhoods, even though it's super ghetto. I don't know how um, how that would work very well, but carrying around like snack packs, like having a backpack full of chips, Doritos, um, all all the candies that you can have selling, selling a specific candy bar or specific cookie. Like have the snacks on deck ready for those stoners. Or for elderly people, sell them like Metamucil or something like Tums for their stomach. (laughs) Fucking, you want to buy a box of cookies? I would, but I get indigestion. Well, don't worry, sir. If you buy two boxes, I'll throw in these Tums for you. (laughs) Fucking, I'm revolutionizing the the, 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 the scouting industry right now. I like the la- this last one we talked about, but the alcohol part, I don't, I don't think you get any of that to fly. Because who's regulating it? Like, sure, you have a guardian walking around with them, but who's, who's making sure that that, you know, that bottle of doesn't slip out? Well, we're, we would have the kids who would sell it. They would have their parents with them. So, yeah. what happens when Johnny drinks all of the inventory? Then Johnny's dad's going to be paying for all the inventory he drank. It's the same reason why you would sell candy. If you ate any of the candy, you had to put whatever it was the price of it in there. Next thing you know, you're like, Dad, you ate like 20 Kit Kats. Just tell me how much it is. I'll pay for it. Dad, that's like 60 bucks. Holy fucking shit. You're, you're kidding me. $60 for 20 God. Oh, God. Oh, God. We're going in the hole. Nobody's getting uh, dinner tonight. Holy shit. Hmm. <laughs> I'm telling there's, you, there's only a, there's just a few holes in that, the alcohol idea. Okay, well then take out the alcohol idea, but selling like better products to f- go with your cookies, maybe you get more sales. Or yeah. just don't, don't even sell cookies anymore. I mean, sell freaking if you're if you're in Colorado, you know that's a highly stoner area. Start selling edibles. <laughs> I I like like the different product idea because what with the Girl Scouts just having their one like. I think mostly it's there for like branding. Like that's the main reason. Yeah. 
you know, whenever you think of Boy Scouts or Girl Scouts, Boy Scouts, you think of like pocket knives and badges and doing like camping and training. And when you think of Girl Scouts, you think of the cookies, you think of, you know, this, the dresses, you think of, you know, the beret thing that they wear, ponytails, all that type of stuff. But when you look mm-hmm. at like, so my conspiracy theory kind of arrived when there's this guy in my town who rides around on a bicycle at any time of day, any season, even in winter, he's pulling this giant wooden cross that's on a wheel so he has on his bike he just rides around town not saying anything just going around it's lit up and everything and everybody knows this guy distinctively no they don't know his name they don't talk to him but he just has this cross and just rides around he's a bit of an older nobody man. nobody knows him well there's probably someone out there that knows him but i know he no, he doesn't like a suit no one knows what he's up to that's what i'm saying he's just riding around everywhere you see him you're like damn that dude's riding everywhere he's just always there what i think is inside of the cross i told my buddy this and it's a good theory he's selling drugs i wouldn't doubt it because imagine having those drugs in the cross and he rides around on his bike everywhere i mean he'll go over like all over the whole state man like it's ridiculous to see how far that guy travels he just feels like all the time he rides a bike and i'm like Imagine if he's just going to different drop locations and just going to businesses and like pulling drugs out of the cross. I'm like, that dude's yeah. the biggest cocaine fucking mobster of all time and nobody knows. You just see the cross and immediately think, oh, he can't be doing anything wrong. He's into Jesus. Yeah. No, no one thinks anything of it. He, it leads back to the second coming project because maybe he's working for Jesus's clone, the one that's messed up and turned out to be like the godfather. <laughs> I like it. Oh, bro. My, I get deep with this stuff. Huh. I'll sit there and start Wait. talking about a theory, and next thing I know, I'll be like, I actually might talk myself into this. <laughs> you know, that's a really good idea. I just found a business opportunity. So All I'm right. buying a pound of cocaine. I'm going to have to go. Tonight. <laughs> I'm going to have to go and find this guy. Hey, man, I know you're selling drugs. You want to sell drugs for me? I don't sell drugs. Well, you want to start? <laughs> That's a good, that's, a, that's the best response. Hey, I know you're selling drugs. <laughs> what? I know you're I'm selling, selling drugs. drugs. I'm not mad at you. I'm not a cop. I'll show you my nipples and everything. But let me tell you, you could be making a hell of a lot more money if you work for me. Boy, do I have a business opportunity for you. Imagine you carry two crosses. Double the product. <laughs> double the land. Double the coverage. <laughs> So have you ever, I know you did a podcast on the men in black, right? Yeah, yeah, we did. Do you, did, now did you do anything about that machine that went with it? The po- the poly bias machine, the polybius machine? Uh, no, not, we didn't really talk too much about it. Do you think that came up at one point? Do you think that is like a, that's a kind of a relatively like easy conspiracy theory to believe in the fact that there was a machine that was not maybe, maybe not monitored by the FBI, but it was a way of kind of programming or doing an MK ultra form to people. Cause a lot of people still think MK ultra is a conspiracy theory and it's not, it's a, it's a state and program and experiments that the government used to do. I would say it happened, but it's still happening. Yeah. Well, there's obviously forms of mind control. See, people think when they think mind control, they think of Professor Xavier doing that type of form of mind control, or they think a giant machine literally controlling your brain. It's all about auditory and a little bit of what we would call hypnosis through sound or Mm -hmm. different features and context. I mean, the fact that when you get hypnotized or when people listen to when they go to bed, positive affirmations, that positive voice, Mm -hmm. like George Takai does one. I actually listened to it. It's pretty terrifying, honestly. Um, (laughs) You put these headphones on and you go to sleep and next thing you know, you hear George Takai going, you are positive. Oh my. And you're like, oh my God. And it's like you're supposed to wake up and feel more refreshed. But who's to say like when you slip off into dreamland, that's when the your brain's recovering the most, that, you know, he doesn't slowly start telling you to murder everyone you ever loved. I, I believe that could happen. I Before we did this podcast, I found this pamphlet on hypnosis. And it was someone just saying that, you know, the common beliefs of what hypnosis is, isn't really what it truly is. And so I kind of dug a little bit into it, not too much. I didn't go crazy, but then I got an understanding of hypnosis is kind of like subtle hidden messages here and there that change 
that slowly change your, your way of thinking. It's not this man dangling a coin in front of your face that gets you to like walk around like a monkey every time that the dude snaps his hand. Like that's not necessarily what it is, but there are different ways that you can get people like you manipulate them through hypnosis, just subtle, subtly. And so but that it can be used and so in bringing up men in black it's you know little things that you know government officials did to kind of remove information yeah, it makes sense i mean the fact that like you try and forget something you can be hypnotized by maybe killing that's what electroconvulsive therapy is um when uh the only it's basically what they call the only cure for schizophrenia because schizophrenia affects such a part of the brain the they call it a cure because whenever you start to have those tendencies or a certain reaction that they're trying to eliminate starts to occur in the brain, they shock you. So it's like when you put a shock collar on a dog, um, when it runs out of the field, eventually after like 30, 40 shocks, that dog learns to, that it can only run a certain distance. It can only run this mm -hmm. far until something happens, you know? So. Yeah basically trains the brain that way i think if you look at like i have another theory actually this one i believe a little bit more into and i think a lot of people are getting interested in it only on the concept of i'm an insomniac so i don't sleep really uh, my buddy sleeps with his eyes open so we thought interesting it, we thought yeah it's fucking scary um he, he didn't tell me either uh i thought i was having a full-on conversation with him and then he was like were you talking to me? I was like, what? He's like, dude, I was asleep, man. I was like, what do you mean you were asleep? Your eyes were open. He goes, yeah, I sleep with my eyes open. I'm like, you got to warn somebody. <laughs> happens. I was talking that to myself. So I, was like, I was like, when'd you go to bed? He goes, I think I fell asleep around like 12. I'm like, dude, it's 3 a.m. right now. I was talking to myself for three hours. <laughs> he goes, yeah, I don't remember it. I was like, okay. That's the, that's the worst. When you're talking to someone and you're looking the other way and then they walk away and you have no fucking clue that they're gone and you're just talking to yourself. I was wondering why he was so quiet. No one's there. I was, like, he's like, not, shit. I was like, he's not answering me. So I kept trying to change the subject or talk about something. And eventually it was like so early. It was like so, I was like, guess so late at night. I just kept on talking and just didn't even respond to him that he didn't answer. I guess in my head I thought he was answering and he wasn't. But um, so my theory on sleep. So, you know, the idea of alternate universes or kind of parallel timelines. Yeah. Okay. So like right now, um, there's a theory called the B theory of time where the past exists, the present exists, but the future doesn't exist. And this is the concept that right now, as I'm talking to you, there is in another time period the war of 1812 is happening right now as me and you are having a conversation. I'm not saying I believe it. I'm not saying anything like that. But when it comes to sleep, what I think, you know what we call rapid eye movement? Uh, no, remind me. So when you, when you shut your eyes and everything, if you look at someone who has their eyes shut and you maybe open up their eyelid when they're sleeping, their eyes going all over the place, like back and forth. Oh, okay, yeah. Okay, so... I relate this to the hypnic jerk. The hypnic jerk is when you're falling asleep in your bed um, and like you're in a dream or something and you get woken up and you feel like you just fell. Like you feel like you ever yeah. just get jerked awake. Okay. Yep. Well, that happens when your brain senses that you've dropped to such a low of a heart rate that it thinks you're dying. So it shocks itself awake. But what oh, I, I chalk what I chalk it up to, I did I did a massive sleep study because I was like, why are we, me and my buddy, really really messed up in the head when it comes to sleep? So, what I think is, you know how whenever it talks about going to a parallel universe or another dimension, they bring up the fact that it's like a doorway you walk in, you know, you open up the door, next thing you know, it looks like Mars or something. It's a lot like Monsters Incorporated. Okay. <laughs> so imagine a dream is a, a doorway that's being opened, another universe that you're slipping into. And your rapid eye movement is your brain searching for another dream. Yeah. So when you have the hypnic jerk, is that you falling back into reality? That's, that's, a, that's a good one. That's my theory. I, I'm I, really like that. I created that one myself. I was like, that is not maybe true, but it, you could add so much to that to make it sound really fucking believable. Yeah. You could take off from here. Cause there's, I mean, there's different layers of dreams. I don't know if anyone 
can relate. But like, there's always there's some dreams where it's it's all everything. Then there's some dreams where everyone is glued to the chair and can't move anywhere. Like, all kind of similar, but a little different. So those are the different universes that, that you're getting into. There's always subtle differences too, but also the fact that there's a thing called lucid dreaming where you can literally figure out that you're in a dream and then you can change the whole way of the dream. Yeah, that's I, that's how I dream. There's times when, not, there's not all the time, but if I'm f- focusing on it when I go to sleep, there's a, I feel like I'm, I'm in the dream and I can move around and go do whatever I want to do. And there's a thing called one aeronautics where people will literally go, they practice the art of going into somebody's dream, like inception. Um, it's called one ironancy. And it's literally like ways of um, these people using like a form of what they would call astral projection, but a way of projecting their mind into someone else's dream and helping them overcome something like a nightmare. Um, Usually when it comes to the brain and dreams and nightmares and all these things, it's something that you're not dealing with in your subconscious that gets awakened when you sleep, whether you gloss over it in your everyday life. So your best thing to overcome a nightmare um, is to have a dream journal. And as soon as you wake up, write down everything that was scary. There's three steps to overcoming a nightmare while you're in the process of it. One, realize that it is a nightmare. It's nothing real. It's going to hurt you. Two, commit to whatever is about to happen to you and realize that it's going to happen and there's nothing you're going to be able to do about it. Just kind of accept it. Three is try and fight back. Yeah. And all these things can kind of shift your projection of a nightmare where afterwards you don't wake up feeling like you were defeated or wake up feeling like, you know, it really impacted you so bad, which I think are, it's, these are just amazing things. I mean, creativity is probably one of the best interests of most people. Um, all people, we all have this mm-hmm. individuality or this spark about us. And I think that's what makes conspiracy theories whenever I hear one, no matter how unbelievable or how believable it is. It's definitely interesting to know that someone could think that up. Yeah. Yeah. Someone had that train thought to go, what connects to what and why? It, times when I had to ask how I said, someone actually believes this or did you make this up? He says, no, there's a group of people that believe that <laughs> this is what's going on. You're full of shit. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. And the Pringles guy's a good guy. Yeah, okay. All right. That's, <laughs> he's got no mouth. He's got a mustache. That's it. <laughs> well, hey, Regis, it's been awesome having you on the podcast, man. I really appreciate you taking the time to be, come out here and do this, dude, for real. Yeah, absolutely. I'm glad that we were able to make it work. Sorry for the delay, but thanks so much for having me on. No problem, dude. Um, I want to give you here a minute at the end to kind of promote your content and tell everybody where they can find your awesome stuff, man. Scapegoats Pod. Yeah, uh, Scapegoats, a, com- a comedy conspiracy theory podcast. You can find it anywhere that you can find any podcast. Just look at it. It's a picture of a goat. You can see my beautiful face, Todd's semi-beautiful face on there too. But it, it's hard to miss. Plus, it's with Regis, guys, okay? You love the show, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? Well, guess what? He's doing a podcast about conspiracy theories. I'm here now, baby. There you go. He's doing. He's still, he's still in the wings. 